um, those who have been here since the beginning and we've got our anniversary coming up as mentioned four years we're coming to the end of four years so we're actually stepping into our fifth year come I think the first day was the 6th of February was it Pastor Jackie was it the 6th yeah it was the 6th yeah so come the 6th is the actual day that we had the first service on a Sunday for EKC in Nottingham so when that day comes we'll be stepping into the fifth year because most people celebrate like and Sammy celebrated her birthday this week most people celebrate the year of their birth and say oh I'm 25 this day but what you don't realize is that from the moment you turn 24 from that day you're actually stepping into the next chapter of your life does that does that make sense for example when miracle turns as most people will say one if Jesus tarries on the 29th of November 2014 she will actually begin the first day of the second year of her life on that day right now she's entering the first year of her life though she's not the age one does that make sense think about it so you're actually moving on on March the 9th I hope Pastor Jekyll doesn't mind me saying his birth date <laughs> on March the 9th when Kadesh when we celebrate his first birthday however we celebrate it that day he's actually stepping into the second year of his life right now he's completing the first year so think about that when you when you mark the days of your birth from the day you actually mark that day that's not actually the year you are you're actually stepping into the next chapter of your life amen it's something to ponder about okay so i want to speak to you about being loyal to the faith and this is be loyal to the faith 102 because those who will be here i did 101 in about i think 2010 or 2011 i can't remember was it 2011 pastor paul okay i can't remember either and it's very very obvious why we need to be loyal to the faith so if you're going to walk this christian race the way we should then your loyalty is going to be tested who believes that the Bible says that Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, was led to the wilderness. Was led into the wilderness. Thank you, Michael. I'm okay now for now. It says Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, was led into the wilderness. Many of us as Christians, and let me just say this while, while I'm here. If you come to a Thursday evening service, um, some churches have their Bible study during the week, or they call it the, uh, the midweek service. But primarily, Thursday is aimed at building leaders in the kingdom of God. So if you find yourself here and you think, you know what, um, maybe I'm not even a Christian, or I'm thinking about being a Christian, or I'm not sure how this works, or whatever. Um, pardon me, you've come to almost like an advanced class. Because everyone who comes into God's kingdom doesn't stay a child we grow amen so we're building leaders on thursday so though it will be an advanced class it will not be taught in a way that you will not understand what's going on amen i'll do my best to carry you along with me by the grace of god so father lord tonight i just pray that as we open your word that you speak holy ghost that your word stands and all truth be revealed tonight let there be none of me but all of you may i decrease and you increase and at the end of it all, let people's hearts be touched and let what people have come here for, mainly it should be you. Let us encounter you in the fullness of your spirit and the fullness of all things leading to life and godliness. At the end of it all, may we have causes to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I was talking about being loyal to the faith. Amen. So be loyal to the faith 102. And that's the title. And we're going to dig out 101 so that after you've listened to 102, you can go and listen to 101. And we looked at Daniel as a case study. But today we're looking at Jesus Christ. Amen? The person who was most loyal to the faith. But we're going to look at Christ through a letter that the Apostle Paul sends to Timotheus. Amen? That he sends to Timotheus. And should Jesus tarry, one of my next children's name is called Timotheus. Amen. We're going to call him Theo. 
Ooh. I was I was in two minds as whether to release that, but I, I I have the release from the from God. Amen. The person who gave the announcement said that we should keep smiling. So um, I'm going to keep smiling through this message. Uh, Natalia, if you'd just like to get the mic for me to read for me. Well, before Natalia reads, I want to speak again about being loyal to the faith. Many people understand that whenever you are going to go on a path in life, that there will be challenges along the way. There are challenges along the way for those who are married. You know we have challenges. For those who are students, you know you have challenges. For those who are not even students and they're just working, there are challenges. No matter where you find yourself in life, if you're alive, if you're breathing, there's a challenge. It's interesting to know that even this very atmosphere that we live in challenges us. For example, challenge. Why can't I stay in the air? Because of gravity is pulling me down. Amen? Let me see if I can walk on the air. Nope. Gravity pulls me down. So everywhere and in everything that we do, there is a challenge. And Jesus realizes this. And that's why he says that we should take heart. He says to us that those who will enjoy the sufferings with him, paraphrase, enjoy the sufferings with him, those who will take fellowship in the sufferings with him, will also take fellowship in the things that he enjoyed. Amen? Amen. You can't only have one side of the coin. You can't only have one side of what God is doing for us. There are two sides. We must enjoy the sufferings so that we, as he overcome, will overcome as well and enjoy what he enjoys. And he is seated in heavenly places. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen? Amen? So in order to be loyal to the faith, once again, there are some things that we must do in order to build our faith. And the Bible says that faith, love, and hope abide, but above all these, love is the most important one. If you can have love, and the Bible says that God is love, it says that love is kind, love doesn't boast of itself, love doesn't envy, love doesn't make a lie. Love doesn't seek any harm. If you can love the way the Bible says we should love, the way God says we should love, you find out that you begin to live a lifestyle that will enable you to be loyal to God when challenges come, because challenges will come. You have people like me saying, be more dedicated. You have people like um, your leaders saying, hey, come in at times that is not really convenient for you. You have us saying, pray. Have you prayed today? How's your prayer life? And this is all to bring you to the shape, to the man, to the form, to the image of who? Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen? So, we see Jesus show the pattern of how he was loyal. We see the other patriarchs like Abraham, Daniel, Moses, Paul, Samson was put in Hebrews as, he, as a hero of faith, though his end was quite dire, and he decided to put his head on the lap of one who is weak. That's what Delilah means. Someone that's weak, and that weakened him and took away his strength. Well, that's at least one of the interpretations of the, of the name Delilah. We see Gideon. We see Titus, we see Peter, we see John, all these people who didn't see the final promise, the final end, but they still stayed loyal because they knew that something was on the end of the other side. Unlike how things work in this life that you see your reward now or you win the lottery and that's the end of it all. God says, you know, just come to me. Come to me, those who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. So the only way to stay loyal to the faith, the only way to stay in the place where you can represent God as you should is by watching after the example of Christ and the saints and those who have gone on before us. So we're going to look at a letter now that 
the Apostle Paul sends to Timothy, who is a pastor, who is a leader. At some stage, Timothy even became a bishop. So this letter that he writes to Timothy, though it was written many, many years ago, is for us. And not just for pastors. Because we look and see that the, the requirement, as it says here, and it tells us, Timothy first has to live the life of a Christian in order to lead Christians. So the way I live is not for me to say, oh, wow, yes, pastor will live that way and we'll just look at him and we'll live half. No. Paul Washer puts it this way. He says that the musical intercessors, the musical worshippers should know God more than the pastor himself or herself. For those who have female pastors as the head of a church. I say, he says that the musical worshippers, the worship leaders, the lead worshippers, however you want to call them, should know God more than the pastor. Simply because if they're going to take us right into the holies of holies, if they're going to usher in the presence of God, then that's got to be the place where they live. Because pastors have to, like Moses, sometimes step out of there and come and see to people's needs and wash knees and counsel and things like that. Whereas you guys, you should be stuck in the heavenlies. So thanks be to God, I do both. Amen? I'm both in the heavenlies as much as possible. And when sometimes I come down and be relevant and give counseling and things like that. Because as much as I want you guys to know, those who are in the worship team to know God more than me, then if I see that happening, then I will chase God ever the more. Iron sharpeneth iron. The fact that you're waxing greater and stronger in God builds my faith up, makes me want to be like, I want to be like Esther because she's bold in the Lord because she wants to chase after God. I want that. The Bible says covet the good gifts. I don't want to covet Esther's wonderful earrings that's gonna perish one day there was a joke made that um somebody was asking for gold coins gold coins gold coins and then an angel came and said to him why are you asking for gold coins this is what we walk on in heaven so imagine sometimes some of the things that we're screaming for that's what they walk on in heaven and if that's not necessarily our final destination, but that's a place that we should aspire to live as and be like. And they walk on gold. Why are we rushing to have it put in our ears or to have it hung up in our houses? So Paul is writing to Timothy and he's giving him some godly advice as to how he can live his life as a Christian. So as the reader reads this and as I give examples to go alongside what we're reading now, look at this as a letter of this is how I should live my life and how I can use this to hold up against the wiles and the things that the enemy will throw against me. Because if it hasn't happened today and it hasn't happened in a month's time, in the next month, or maybe the next two months at least, something's going to happen to try your faith. And that's what the word of God is there for, to build us up in that. Amen? Okay, so Natalia, please read for us from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith. Pause. Timothy, a true son in the faith. This is another key to being loyal to the faith. Are you a true son? What does it mean to be true? For example, we know because somebody decided to call, is that pink, Esther? Somebody decided to call that color pink and not mink. I'm sorry. Somebody decided to call the color of those boots black, right? And not something else. Somebody decided to call the color of my skin black. However, when I look at it, it's actually brown. Yeah. Right? There was never a day in my life, saints of God, where my dad sat me down and said, Hey, son, you're black. <laughs> I got to this country some years ago. And I found out 
that people of my skin color were being called black and the people that I used to say in Port Harcourt, Nigeria, it's Port Harcourt, not Potakot. <laughs> it's actually Port Harcourt in Nigeria on the south coast, beautiful place. I used to see people of the skin color of um, my dear sister here and others and I didn't think of them as white. I just thought of them as human beings. Thanks be to God for such a training. That's why I don't have a racism problem. I never have. And I never will in Jesus' name. Amen. So until I got to the, to the wonderful land of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, and I found out that they decided to class some certain people. And I found it very weird. Dare I say stupid. But that's a personal opinion. Anyway, where was I before I got to that? Okay, yes, colors. So we decided to call these colors that red, that gold. And we made that decision to call it such. So if somebody now comes because we all have the knowledge that that is black, that's red and that's pink. If somebody now decides to tell me that the color of Samantha's pearls are blue and not cream, then we can tell them, no, that's not true. True or false? Yes? We can establish that because we've come as a community of believers or a community of people to say that this has been established as black and such and such and such. So the Bible says that Timothy is a true son. And Paul is able to make this assessment that he's a true son because he has watched him enough to know that he's a true son. That certain things that he has done in his life has gone over to the place of being true. And he has shown himself as a son because sons do some certain things that servants don't. Or people who are not servants do. So he says that he's a true son in the faith. Because there is a faith that we believe in. What makes somebody a true son? It is how loyal they are to the faith. It is the fact that though you know your leader may have shortcomings or your brother, your sister or someone that you lead may have shortcomings. You do not hold it against them. You cover them in that place. And should for whatever reason you not do that, you by the grace of God come to the person peaceably and apologize and make it a note as a character trait or as a, as a point in your life that you know what I will move away from doing this and especially unlike Ham you don't see that your father though he shouldn't have been drunk go and tell your brothers oh he's drunk like Shem and Japhet you decide to take a, a, a sheet or bed linen or whatever it is and you cover your father's nakedness there are some things that I will never tell you about my father in the Lord, Pastor Ulumide Israel Isiave. There are some things I will never tell you about my pastor in the Lord that, that have gone on before me or my mother in the Lord. There are some things I will never tell you about the people that I lead. Because I care about covering the nakedness of my fellow man. And I saw the curse that it brought upon Ham's descendants. According to historians, I happen to be one of Ham's descendants and people of my skin color. It's not a history lesson in that today, but I say that to say this. If, you, if we do not look at how people have been loyal who have gone on before us, then we have no example, we have no map, we have no route to plot as to how to be loyal. For example, someone could say that being loyal to them is the fact that I bring past the food. I bring past the food every Thursday and every Sunday. I'm showing my loyalty. But yet when pastor says, do something, I don't do it. Simple instruction. Which do you think God wants more? To obey commands? Or to bring lots of money into the house? Someone can pay us five million, five billion. Can be the biggest giver monetary financially in the house. But if they do not obey the commands, if they do not obey the ways and the laws of God, then, then, then what really is it that they're doing? Is that a true son? And when I say son now, I'm including the females. I'm including all mankind. So Paul could testify that Timothy was a true son in the faith. And it doesn't tell us much of the things that Timothy did. But Paul, we have come to agree with Paul because of 
what Paul has done himself to believe that the Holy Spirit has inspired him to write this and write it for a reason. Carry on reading Natalia. So I want you to examine yourself and look at yourself. You know what? Can my leader, can people around me say that I'm a true son in the faith? That I'm a true follower of Christ? And if not, Holy Spirit, am I available for you to teach me and carry me along and help me to become a true son in the faith? Because it has to be the testimony of us. Carry on. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went, to Ma- went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to the fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification. Pause. You might want to sit down on the corner there because you're going to be here a while, dear. He says to Timothy, part B of verse 3, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Sons cause leaders and fathers in the Lord to want to pray for them. There are some of you, and I've told some of you before, that say, I pray for everybody by the grace of God. By the grace of God. One day I'm going to have to answer for the days that I didn't pray for you. And that's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. So anytime I've not prayed for you, the Holy Spirit does keep me up to make sure I pray. Sometimes I skip it. But thank God for the season where that no no longer happens. So I'll have to account for the days in the past. And if they come in the future where I haven't prayed for you. You have to account for days you haven't prayed for me too, by the way. The Bible says that Paul says, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. I'm thinking night and day. Now, um, let me just let you know, Paul was stuck in prison quite a few times in his life. So, you know, and Paul didn't have a wife and a baby. So, I'm not saying that Paul had more time to pray than I did. Maybe he did. An account of being in prison, an account of being a single. That's not where I'm going, but he prayed night and day. And by the grace of God, there's been times I've prayed night and day. And like I was saying, there are some of you that I pray for more than others. And, and it's just simply the case of some have shown themselves to be more true sons. I've said, you know what? My hands are not the everlasting arms of God. But there is enough room for everyone in the house to be a partaker and to be a beneficiary of the life I lead with God and the prayers that those who get more benefit from. Is that understood? Please do not be mad that Paul didn't say something about brother Jerry or whoever that I pray for you night and day. Because there would have been a brother Jerry or brother something that was around the time of Timothy. Case in point, John Mark, for those who know the story in the book of Acts, left the company with Barnabas because it was Paul... Barnabas, John Mark, and, and Silas, or was it Silas, or was it Silas that was with them? And, and John Mark and Barnabas went their own way, and Silas and Paul went their own way. It was either Silas or, um, it was Silas, okay, and they went their own way. So it is clear that Silas showed himself to be more of a son to Paul than John Mark did. Didn't mean that John Mark was going to hell or he was evil. Some people just decide, hey, I see something in this person's life and I want to come under them. I want to benefit from this. And they do benefit. Most people think that, oh, pastor likes this person more. I can't get to that person. It's not true. Have you decided to take a step to come closer? The times that I've met you for the first time or have come across you have said hi and I do say hi. Have you decided to take the other step? The Bible says... He who wants to have friends must show himself friendly. So Paul is able to pray for Timothy because he has shown himself as a true son. If you want extra prayers from me or any leader that you're under, show yourself to be a true son. And one way of becoming a son, especially if the person is not your biological parent and you don't live with the person, is by getting closer to them. You might just learn something. You might Keep reading. Which cause disputes rather than godly edification. 
which is which is uh, which is in faith chap um verse five now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart from a good conscience and from sincere faith pause what verse are you on five verse five Are you reading first or second, Timothy? First. 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 I'm so sorry. Bear with me. You, she's been reading first, Timothy. I've been looking at second, Timothy. It's second, Timothy, I want second, Timothy, chapter two. Bear with me. See, Paul, 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 Paul can do this to you. He starts most of his letters with Paul, an apostle. So once I saw Paul, an apostle, that I thought you were reading what I was looking at. But it's okay. I've been preaching what I've been looking at. So we thank God. Amen. And you guys were all nodding and, and showing that you were following, so we haven't lost ourselves. Sorry, Natalia, it was my fault. Second Timothy, chapter 1. If you can start again from there. God bless you. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus. Jesus our Lord. Amen. Pause. You see how, how Paul's letters start? Quite quite similar. It says to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Keep going. Verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. Verse 4, greatly des- desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. Pause. See that? He's mindful of his tears. When you guys cry, I cry. I'm being serious. When you cry, I cry. Yes. Because God is pained. God cares. As the chief shepherd, he cares about your soul. And shepherds watch after their flock. In both in the physical and certainly as a spiritual reality. It's, it's why God decided to use the way, the, the lifestyle of shepherding for the Israelites so that they could understand the fact that they needed to grow together. They needed to look after one another. So if you, if you guys cry, I cry too. I'm pained by it. And God's going to say, God, I don't want them crying. I want things changing for them. I want them moving in the place where you want them as a son of God. Keep reading. Verse 5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you. Verse 6, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of of my hands. Verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Pause. The Apostle Paul says that, stir up the gift that is in you by the laying on of my hands. The Bible says that lay hands on no man suddenly. If if my memory serves me correctly, Timothy happens to be the only person whom Paul says directly, I laid my hands upon. Apart from if Paul has healed somebody through the laying on of hands. Don't don't call me, don't call me that as that's definite, but from my memory that's, as I'm thinking through, flicking through the Bible in my heart and my mind, Paul has only talked about laying hands on Timothy. There are some things that you release to some people that you don't. A son gets an inheritance. And we know that this year is the sons of God that, that will manifest. He says that. Stir up that gift that I, that I gave to you by the laying on of hands. Think about it. When God touches your life, when God comes and you truly encounter him, you meet him and there really is an exchange. There is something that you won't want to do. Sin will really become very vulgar, become very yucky to you. Sin will become such an enemy that if, if you fall, you are so pained by it that you just want to run back to the place where you no longer want to do it. That you want to live a life of repentance and live a life being called to the faith and being like Christ. That's what an exchange with God will. That's what if God has really touched you, does. 
There is no other evidence to show that somebody is in Christ by the fact that they want to turn around and go the other way. As in go God's way, not the way you were going before. It's the only evidence. Don't be fooled. Like I keep saying, it's not because I can preach. It's not because I can sing. It's not because I can go out there on the streets and speak to people about Christ. Those things are great. And as gifts are the things that come out that may draw people into the kingdom and that may think, oh, wow, maybe I want to get closer to this man and find out what, what, what does he believe behind all of this. Ultimately, it's how I live a lifestyle, a repented life. It's how when you come into the office and, you, and, and maybe and you shouldn't burst into the door and see me doing something. Whatever I'm doing there, that's the real me. That is if I knock... The, sorry, that if you knock on my door, and sometimes I have the, the black sheet covering it if I'm praying or, or I'm doing something that I don't want you to see. I.e. eating lobster and fish and I don't want to share. <laughs> Amen? I don't eat lobster and fish. But basically, if I've got that up and I'm praying, and you knock on the door, and then I take it and I say to you, oh, I'm praying, or I'm doing something. Or if I've got that up and you come in and you knock on the door and I take it down and you now see me there, fully dressed, and another lady there, fully dressed, and we're having a meeting, then you should be worried. However, if you come and you see me having a meeting with, with a member of the opposite sex and there is no sheet covering there and you can see, and it's, you can see the window and there's a window on my office, you can see it through, you shouldn't be worried. Amen? Amen? If you come there and you knock and you see that black sheet is there and I bring it down and there's another man in the room there with me fully dressed and I'm fully dressed, you should be worried. Because even though he's a person of the same sex, why do I have that up there? I don't need to. The reason why we have windows on certain offices and Paso has one on his is that if anybody comes in and we happen to be counseling somebody there, if somebody decides to spread a story of something that didn't happen, at least that screen is there to protect us. And so every person, whether you're a pastor or a leader, whoever is your leader, you should have. Now, in the secular place of business, they don't have this. But even they are wise enough to know that if somebody's having a meeting with someone, they record it down. Don't they, D? For example, they have meeting rooms in many buildings. So at this time, they can log that this meeting was going on and who was present and who was not. It's only at times of appraisal do you find people alone in a room together. And even then, it's being recorded what happens then. And notice is mainly, not just in Christianity, but it's mainly wherever things have not been left for people to check upon that problems have happened. I'm not going to let that be me by God's grace. And I pray to God you will not let that be you. So we see the example, once again, of what Timothy was doing. And we see that his mother, Lois, and grandmother, Eunice, had great faith in them as well. Now, maybe you don't have parents or, or grandparents or in your family who have lived according to the faith of God. And that you can draw and say that, you know what, my mother, my father, or my grandfather was like this. That's fine. That's okay. We can start with you. And by the grace of God, you can pass it on to your generation. Keep reading. Verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering, sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9. Who has Pause. saved... You see, he says, don't be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus. Don't be ashamed that we can't prove that, you know what, though he is alive again, he did die and rise up. Though you can't actually say, you know what, you want to believe that Jesus is alive? Hold on, I'm just going to go and call him so that he can come from heaven and you can see him. Don't be ashamed that it's only by the lifestyle that we live and the fruits that we show that we can only show Jesus being alive. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of that testimony. One day Jesus is coming back soon and he will prove himself. God is big enough to defend himself and show that the things that, as it said, happen in there are true. God is big enough. One day we'll know. That's just the truth of it. 
He says, don't be ashamed that I'm in prison because of this. Don't be ashamed. Don't, don't cry for me. Don't cry for me that, you know what, maybe like, unlike some other people, I don't have the best of things and that, you know what, I could be earning more money doing something else and also be, be, be a missionary in the place of business. Don't, don't, don't be, it's okay. Paul is saying, don't be ashamed. Hold on to these things because in these sufferings, this builds up strong faith in me. Like Jesus being led into the wilderness, the fact that he was tempted of the devil. It says that when he came out, his fame went abroad. When he came from that battle in the wilderness, that's when the miracles started flowing. That's when the ministry of Jesus skyrocketed. That's when God's name was made famous. That's when all the healings, everything else took place. There was a wilderness. There was a 40 days of just drinking water. There was a time of testing. There was a time of proving. Because greater battles were coming. And greater battles were coming for you. And you need to use the time of before these greater battles come to learn how to be loyal and to stand strong and steadfast in the faith. The Bible says that the fervent prayer, the steadfast prayer, my translation, the continuous prayer of a righteous, of someone who decides to do what God does, avail it much. Keep reading. Verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immorality, immortality to light through the gospel. Okay, pause. Natalia, that wasn't a slip of the tongue. I said to God, you know, God... You mentioned something to me about immorality in praying today. And I was like, God, no, I don't want to mention immorality. Because, you know, we mention it so much in this house. That's why the seats are empty. Hallelujah! (laughs) Pastor Joke, you know, I don't want to tell you some of the text messages I've got lately. And some of the things I've seen. But we will keep on saying that immorality, sexual immorality is wrong. If it means that this is the church I have, I'm fine with that. I will not not talk about it so that we can have so many people here and jumping and dancing and they all go to hell. That's not going to be me. So thank you for the slip of tongue, but which was by the Holy Spirit, Natalia. As I was preparing for the message and praying, God said to me, you know, today you need to speak about sexual immorality. And I was like, God, why? Again, we always talk about this. So... You know, if I love the Lord, then I will listen to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's come. And I want to say this. If you are loyal to the faith, then you will take every single instruction that the faith has. And the faith manual is there. The Bible, King James Version, I like. New American Standard Bible, I like. English Standard Version, I like. New International Version, I don't like so much. New Living Translation, I don't like so much. And the reason I don't like those so much is because some of their, their translation do lose some of the realness, or should I say the strongness of what the word says. Because now, thanks be to God, some really smart people have decided to bring upon lexicons where we can see the original words in the Greek and the Hebrew. And we know how much English as a language is such a low level language compared to the ancient languages like arabic and aramaic and hebrew and those those are rich languages they really when you look at some of the meanings of some of the words that we look here in the in the bible and you see what it means it gives the bible such a greater meaning so and also the niv some verses are actually missing in the niv I can't remember which one of the I remember reading it one day. And I was like, hold on a second. I've read that verse before. Where's this? So I went to my King James Version Bible and I saw it wasn't there. Surprise, surprise. The person who owns the rights of the New International Version Bible is Rupert Murdoch. Yes, go and Google it. Rupert Murdoch is for all intents and purposes. What's a nice way of saying this? Okay. What would Jesus do? So Holy Spirit, give me the word. Rupert Murdoch calls himself a media mogul. Yes. 
He calls himself a media mogul. He clearly says that he wants to own all the media in the world so that he can control what comes out in the news. Now, I understand as, as a businessman that if you want to have what you are projecting out there be the top, then of course you want to own all the big corporations. Hence why he tried to take over Sky so many years ago. But because it's British Sky Broadcasting, they said, uh, sorry, in Britain, we don't allow just one person to rule the whole corporation. You have a share in this. Because if he decides to rule the whole corporation, like the Sun and the other papers he has, we'll start seeing some things on our television that we don't want. So, you know, one day, because wealth does shift hands, and hopefully it will shift into my hands and that I will, I will buy out Rupert Murdoch's part of Sky. Yes, I'll say again. I'll buy out his share in Sky and take off all those silly channels that you get to the end. Yes, those silly channels. TVX, or that's quite old. And, and all those channels that just promote the degrading of not just women, but the degrading of men. Because these women that are being degraded, men are being led to them like dogs. So back to sexual immorality. If you say you're going to be loyal to the faith, then every single part of the faith we decide to take on. You don't say because it's easy for me not to lie, I'll decide not to lie. And hey, you know what? I've fallen in the place of sexual immorality before. I can't, I can't get up. You know what? God understands. I keep falling. Then I'm not going to do anything. No, you have to do something about it because... Trust me, one day you're going to get to a place where somebody will want to marry you. And yes, it's true, somebody will want to marry you. Whether they're so saved or not, somebody will want to marry you. And if this person happens to be, God help them, a saved person, and they're the part of that union that they show Christ and you have to get to them, they will have to deal with the effects of what your sexual sexual immorality lifestyle has. So if you don't deal with it now, your spouse in the future will suffer. If you don't learn how to block your eye gates from watching the things you shouldn't. Young man, if you don't learn right now that when a woman walks past, whether she's dressed correctly or not, that you keep your eyes fixed on the Lord by keeping it level and in the sky and not down at her chest or her behind, that if you don't learn how to cancel that now, come when you're married, you'll still keep doing it. It doesn't just change over because you're married. Young woman, if you don't realize that if you keep looking at that man on the health men's magazine or wherever it is that you look at it, if you don't learn to stop and not say, oh, how I wish my husband could have packs like him. You are in danger, young woman. You are in danger, woman, of letting that form a psyche in your mind so that even to the place, and especially for women, when you are actually making love to your husband that you are imagining that man oh yes i won't go into details but trust me there are people that i know who when they try to have sex with their partners another person's face flashes before them and they have to stay so many times and hours in prayer to get that image out their mind before they can have sex i know this for sure There are people that when they go to do what married people should do, that during the time or even a time of climax or whatever it is you want to call and I'm being very real to you here, they end up seeing somebody else's face or feeling like they're being with somebody else or someone else is in the room. Do you know that, and I'll give you a background here. Yes, I lived a life of sexual immorality and God delivered me many years ago. Thanks be to God, God delivered me years years before I got married. Unfortunately, I won't go into details. My wife and I were in that place where we were living immorally. We weren't having, we weren't having, we weren't living a sexual lifestyle, but we were living immorally, doing things close to it. And the Bible says that Jesus says, if you look onto a woman, if you look onto a person with a lost wife, you've committed adultery. Do you know how it's adultery? Because that's somebody else's wife, that's somebody else's husband that you've looked at and imagined having sex with them. So imagine now if you touch and agree. Imagine now if you kiss and do things that suggest to you, that makes you want to go further. Imagine now if you decide to, oh, have sex with your clothes on. But, oh, but we didn't penetrate. It's still the same thing. That's why Jesus said, if you look at somebody and say, hmm, Straight away you committed it because an intent always starts in the heart. Thanks be to God I'm married. Let's fast forward now. I only need to look at my wife and bang, some things are happening. Amen? 
One of those is miracle. So coming back to those living the sexually immoral lifestyle once again, if you do not learn how to cancel this out of your life now, because it's the one sin that harms your very body, all the other sins are done outside the body, the one of sexual immorality is done and affects your very being. There are people who because of this, and if they don't deal with it well before they get married, they find themselves serial adulterers, both men and women. So to escape this, to flee from this, to make sure that this doesn't become into your lineage and your children to come, you best cancel it whilst you can. The reason why we have fallen into it is because of our ancestors and our forefathers. But it is not an excuse because they did it and that it's in our bloodstream that we should go ahead and do it. The Bible says that by the filling of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Ghost, when someone decides to be born again anew in Christ, he is what? A new creature. And new creatures think differently. And when you start thinking differently, you will stop doing the things with your eyes that you were doing before. So it starts from the mind and it starts from the heart. And that's the place you must win it. So back to my point. If you're going to be loyal, you can't say, you know what? I will live holy. I won't do the sexual immoral thing, but I will still drive a car without road tax or I'll drive without insurance. The Bible says, obey the law of the land. You're kidding yourself if you're saying, oh, but someone needed to get somewhere and I needed to drive this person somewhere and this was the only car available, but you have no license and you can drive. Woe unto you. You can't decide to take one part of the law and not take the other. You can't say, okay, I'll do all the nine commandments. But the last one, thou shalt not covet that neighbor's goods. No, 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 no. I, I just like Esther's bag too much. I have to have it. You have to live according to the whole tenants. That's why they were all given. If it wasn't important, why, would, why wouldn't God put it in there? And Jesus even helped us out. He said that these two sum up the whole law. Love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Heart, the seating, where everything comes from, out of the heart, out of the, the, out of the heart, what's the word again? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the things that are coming out of my mouth, not just on the pulpit, but on a regular daily basis is what really lives in my heart. And what I put my strength to do, that's what matters to me. And what I let my mind engage in, that determines what will be my influence. Or where is I go? And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. I'll add to that. He says, love your enemies. Do good to them who hate you. That means that every single person you walk with or encounter, you have to love them. So imagine if you love your enemy. Imagine what, your, what great love you have for those who are not your enemies. And Jesus says that who, give, who gives a reward to someone that, that, that they love? Will you ever get a reward for loving your brother, your sister, or for loving your mother, your father, your wife, your son. You're expected to. It comes easy. It's easy for me to love someone who comes into the church for the very first time. But let me love the person who comes into church and decides to inflict pain against someone I love. Let me love that person. That shows whether I truly love. Let me love the person who decides not to have the same faith as me. Who's not convicted that Jesus Christ is God. Let me love that person. That shows whether I truly love. Let me love the person who, has, who knows nothing about Christ. Who if I go and say to them that this is the way to choose the life. They will look at me and walk off. Let me love that person. That shows whether I truly love. Let me be like Christ. Come down to a people on earth and decide that they want nothing to do with me. But I'll still die for them. I'll still shed my blood. Knowing that one day maybe they will just get it. That's the true testament of love. That's the true showing that I'm loyal to the faith. I'm back to sexual morality and I close on the sexual morality point with this. Those who choose not to cheat on their spouse show that they're loyal. Those who are married here and you can testify to me. When that day comes, if Jesus tarries, 
where you're either where either your husband or you're on your deathbed and you've lived the full life we all know we're going to die one day nobody can escape it the christian knows that to to live is death and to die is what gain because when you die in christ hey you have life everlasting there's more trouble while i'm alive because at any moment i could fall but when i die and i die in him no more falling no more sinning hey those who realize those who realize that you know what if I or my husband can lay on that deathbed and he can tell me and look me in the eye and I know when he tells the truth because I live with him for many, many years and, and we've lived a godly life in Christ and say, you know what? I was faithful to you to the end. Honey, so-and-so, I was faithful to you to the end. And maybe, just maybe, because some people have had this and some people have stuck around like, like Hosea and his wife. Maybe at her deathbed. Because it doesn't tell us whether, you know, it, it just tells us that Hosea keep, kept taking her back. Maybe, just maybe, she changed and she said, you know what, honey, I'm sorry that I lived the life of, of, of betraying you, of being unfaithful to you. But towards the end, I was faithful. Do you know how happy Hosea would have been? Do you know how happy God is when he realizes that, you know what, we don't serve any other God with our affections? Do you know how happy I am to know that when my baby was born, and, and I'm going there with this, when I saw her face, that I could see my image, my very face on her. Now, I didn't pray that she had to look like me. I don't care about that. But do you know how pleased I was to see that? Do you know how pleased my wife is to know that when I come home, and thanks be to God, she's pretty prophetic, that she knows that I haven't been with another woman? Do you know how pleased she is that if I ever have a dream or the enemy sends me a dream where there's been sexual activity that's happened and it's not been her that I tell her each and every time. Do you know how happy she is? So that she can pray for me against these attacks of the enemy that, that, that the enemy wants to bring to me. Well before I got married, because I lived a life of sexual promiscuity, God told me that this was how the devil was going to bring me down. So when these dreams come in certain seasons of my life, I, I, I'm not foolish, as in I'm not foolish to think that God is not trying to tell me something, that hey, this is what the enemy is trying to do to me to bring me down. So anytime I, have, I tell my wife, because I want her to be aware that this is what the enemy is trying to bring my way. Do you know how happy she is to know? Do you know how happy before we got married and, and I found somebody else attractive that I told her? Do you know how glad she was that I actually said that? Now, let me caveat that. I wasn't dreaming about this woman or doing anything with her. But I was honest enough to tell her how I truly felt. Because at the end of the day, I don't for one second believe that my wife is the only beautiful woman on the face of the planet. That's, that's a silly thinking. And for a split second, when I thought something that I thought, you know what? Let me let my wife know this. Because who knows down the end, if she doesn't pray along with me, something that the enemy is preparing. One silly dot, dot, dot person that the enemy might be preparing in the future to make me fall. By being honest, by being faithful, we are able to come into the image of Christ together. Don't play with sexual immorality. Some people never recover and some people never come back. I won't mention their name, but I know people who are in their 80s now who are still cheating on their wives. And they come to every end of year service and lift up their hands. And we don't see them back till the next end of year service. When I say end of year service, I mean on the 31st of November of December. Look how many people were in the house on that day. Where are they now? And some of these people, God knows, I know, they don't have churches. It's not that they came visiting from another church to Steffi. They actually don't have churches. But it's the end of the year. It's the last day. Let's come. In case the rapture happens, I'll be in church. And I'll go, lie. You won't go. You will not go. Pastor Paul, is that not true? They will not go. Because they have not given their heart over to him. They're not faithful. They're not loyal to him. You will not go. God doesn't play games like that. There was once I felt the wrath of hell. I found myself in the house of a friend and I fell asleep and the moment I awoke, what awoken me was a vision as plain as day as I was living now. There's a difference between a vision and a dream. I had woken up from sleep 
And from waking up from sleep, I went into a trance somewhere and I literally felt hell burning. And I saw a hand pull me out. I shouted, <gasps> and everyone looked at me and said, what happened? And I told them what happened. So I know it's real. I've had the personal experience. You may believe me or not, but there is a way of coming into this and knowing this. By getting yourself so wrapped up in that wor- word, you'll begin to see some of these things. Don't play with sexual morality. Some people don't come back. Believe it or not, it's not just only men, it's women as well. Some women, because they didn't kill that appetite of sleeping around, find themselves still doing it. Not just in their marriage, find themselves unmarried and just, just, just giving themselves to any Tom, Rick or Harry. And it is a shame. So don't play with it. You're not for sale. You're not cheap. You're bought with a price. You're a precious jewel before the Lord. You must be loyal and faithful to him. And you can be. Just keep yourself around him. Because once you're around him, he keeps you so close to you. He keeps you so close to him. He shows you the beautiful and wonderful things about him. When you get to a certain place of reading God's word, even the genealogies, the thing that said this person begat this and begat this, the way to make sure it's not boring for you, find out what those names means of those people. Do you find out the richness in God's word? There's no way you won't want to fall in love with him and stay with him. I'll say it again. Don't play with sexual morality. You may just never return. That's one way of being loyal, showing your true loyalty. By only having one, 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 one sexual partner. Your wife or husband, after the time you've told people you've been married. Amen? So whether you decide... To, to live together after they've done the engagement in Nigeria and they said you've married, that's how you said you're going to be married, that's fine. Live together. Have children, do whatever. If you're going to have the wedding later, great, that's fine. But make sure, make sure that there are witnesses there to credit the fact that you have both been married. Okay, keep reading. Verse 11. To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I am also, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Verse 13. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith. Hold fast the pattern of sound words. Sound words, not flimsy words. That's why the Bible says that we shouldn't have any coarse joking. That's why your jokes will be questioned. You will have, we will have to account for our jokes. Must be sound words. Don't let... I said it last week or... No, the week before. If I come here and start saying some things that just sounds nothing like this Bible, please, besides praying for me, feel free to send a note to one of the leaders in case they don't, in case they don't want to come and tell me. Because maybe they're thinking the same thing. Uh, can you just speak to Pastor Shepherds, you know? not sure where this is going this is not sound please help me i'm a man i can fall very very easily or or you know if you want to be very wise wait till after the service and you know just <laughs> come and speak to me amen because i don't want to be one of those that it talks about one of the pastors that's came and said but we we casted out demons we we healed the sick we preach great messages and people loved us Thank you for loving me, but let Jesus say to me, well done. That's, that's what I'm looking for. And for you, I'm looking for you to say, oh, yes, that pastor told me that I should pray and be like Jesus. It has to be sound words, not just anything that will just come and make a hoo-hoo-hoo. I'm not here to come and entertain you. I'm here to speak words of spirit and life. Amen? That's why my jokes are holy. Not W-H-O-L-L-Y, H-O-L-Y. Amen? Keep reading. In faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus, verse 14, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This, is you, this you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Herman Jeans. Okay, the- Pitt, pause one second. Thank you, Natalia. God bless you. Um, you may be seated. Uh, Chrissy, can you put up for me, please, what the blueletterbible.org says about the name 
Phygelus and Hermogenes comes from. I want to speak about three things as I close. Uh, besides these names. Power, love, and a sound mind. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us, what he has he given us? Power, love, and a sound mind. These are utensils, or if you like, weapons that we use to stay loyal in the faith, to stay strong in the face of temptation. You need power. You certainly love, because if you love God, he says that he makes all things work for good for those who love him. So please don't forget that for those who love him part. Because a lot of people say, oh, God makes all things to work for my good. No, for those who love him. Amen? For those who love him makes it work for their good. And a sound mind. He says that a double-minded man is unstable in his ways, in all his ways. He cannot please the Lord. And says that faith pleases the Lord. So by being loyal to the faith, you're pleasing the Lord. And I believe that each and every single one of us here wants to please the Lord. So by having faith in him, by having a sound mind, knowing that this is where I'm going, my straight is straight, my left is left, my right is right, my yes is yes, my no is no, my I don't know is I don't know. Because if you don't have a sound mind, if you're, if you're not who you say you are, if you, if you don't keep to your word, if you're not integrous, then nobody is going to want to have anything to do with you, let alone the people who do not believe in your God. Because at the end of the day, Paul says that I was called unto the Gentiles. God who is nothing like humans, who created humans, shows us how to be came in the form of flesh to show that you know what this is how God lives and this is how you can be there was an example of Jesus Christ and that's the example we're to follow he was loyal to the end and we are to be loyal to the end we must have love and the only power we should have is that of the Holy Spirit and a sound mind can't be unstable you can't be double-minded so if you're unsure like james 1 5 says ask of god who, who doesn't know anything ask god for wisdom so you can know what to do in that situation have we got the meaning of those names up it's from verse verse 15 i want the meaning of the name phygelus and hermogenes So some people in Asia, and it's not just the Asia that we know today, it's more of the eastern part of Asia. So if you look at the eastern part of Asia, for those of us who know the map of the world very well, we're looking at places like Turkey, Greece, Crete. Um, we're looking at uh, um, Macedonia, that part. More eastern, not necessarily eastern block of Europe, but that Turkey, Greece, Crete, Macedonia area and just to the east of um, Jerusalem that's the Asia that Paul is talking about so some people have turned away alright Phygelus means let me come and read this because I can't see it Ugh. a little fugitive surprise surprise this person leaves Paul who knows what a fugitive is there's the lawyers among us who knows what a future fugitive is? I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Someone running away from the law. Somebody running away from the law. And we know that even the law written to, in today's day and age, where did it stem from? The law of God. The Bible. They've got don't kill. They've got don't steal. They've got don't murder. They've got don't commit adultery. Even though it's not against the law to commit adultery in today's day and age. What a problem. <laughs> um, but yet, they say it clearly that if somebody decides to have sex with someone who's under 16, they have committed a crime, right? 
However, in some countries, you are allowed to be married before the age of 16. So I wonder if this happens, whether they will take somebody to jail. Now, we know in our day and age, 14 and 15 year olds don't get married in some certain circles. And somebody might want to say, oh, but Mary gave birth to Jesus when she was 14 or 15. Well, the Bible does say that nothing is new under the sun. However, we are to observe the customs and times that we find ourselves in. In their day, from the moment a girl or a guy was born, they were being prepared for manhood and womanhood straight away. It doesn't really happen today. Amen? I find it very, very hard to see many 14 or 15 year olds who have been ready as Mary was. Amen? I'm not God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Things could turn out that they could come back full circle and be as how they were in the days of old. But it is clear in this day and age, given the lifestyle that we lead now, 14 and 15 year olds of this day and age, hardly, 99.999%, I can say, are not ready for marriage. Amen? Somebody who runs away from the law is a fugitive. And it says a little fugitive. When you think of something little, you think of something that is unable to carry weight. So a little person who runs away from the law. Imagine five jealous is running away from God's standard. And it doesn't say that, that but that's what, I, that's what I pick up from that. This person turns away. Surprise, surprise, he turns away and, and leaves poor. Hermogenes. What is that? Lucky born or born of Mercury. Now I'm trying to remember what Mercury was. Is there any other, is there any other ones apart from that? For those who don't know, lucky, the word luck is deciphered from the name Lucifer. Now we know Lucifer has a, has a good meaning as in light holder, but because of who Lucifer became, we know in the world that luck runs out. So please don't call your child lucky. And please don't give your children any of these names because you don't want them to be a little fugitive. And you don't want them to be born of Mercury. Mercury happened to be one of the indigenous gods from the olden days. Are there any other translations for what homogenes means, Chrissy? No. Oh, sorry, I keep saying Chrissy Dorinda. Okay, thank you. So the point I want to make there with the names is this. Another signifying that you're loyal to the faith is what you call a thing, a business, a child, yourself. What is your name? A name carries a nature. A name carries a character trait. And these people lived out, especially if I jealous, lived out what his name was. Hermogenes manifested what his name was. Timotheus means honoring God. Now, there are some amongst us who unfortunately were given names that weren't nice. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to live that out. Because when you are now in Christ, anything is possible in him. I'll read the rest of the verses as I close. Verse 16 says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Can you put, on the, put up the meaning of Onesiphorus, please? Verse 17, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Do read more of First Timothy. It will help you in your journey. Not just as a leader in the house of God, but in in being loyal to the faith of God and becoming like Christ. What does that mean? I love this. If this name wasn't so, you know, quite mouthful, I'd, I'd, I'd want to steal that for, for a child of mine in the future. Bringing profit. Bringing profit. 
Is it a surprise that this is someone who came out and saw at Paul to refresh him? Names matter. And the meanings of names matter. So once again, I don't say this to put scorn on anyone who doesn't maybe know what their name means or it doesn't mean something good. You don't have to live out the ones that don't mean something good. You don't have to. Once you're in Christ, you can, like the people who have gone on before, be loyal to the faith. I want us to stand up and pray a few prayers before we close. I want to turn to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms written by people who had deep connection, a deep worship lifestyle with God and would write their thoughts and write things that God revealed unto them and write their prayers. And as every time that we hear something being spoken of, we know that we must guard our lives with the one weapon that we have, the one thing that Jesus said we should do always, which is what? Pray. It's the one thing says so pray always. It does say we should love. It does say that we should have hope and all these other things. But there's only one thing that Jesus says to do always without season, and that's pray. You must have a prayer life. You must have a prayer life. I must have a prayer life. I'm dead without it. Forget it. Without a prayer life? Oh, no, no, no. It's finished. So Psalm 64 it's a psalm of David, and it says, Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from the fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows, bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privily. They say, who shall see them? We know that who shall see them? God shall see them. They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search, both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded, so they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. Now let's read verse 10 together. The righteous and shall trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. So one more time. The righteous shall and shall trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. We're going to pray according to verse 2 and 3, and then we're going to declare verse 10 again one more time afterwards. Verse 2 says there again, to remind me, hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity. Those that raise an insurrection are those that say, you know, come, like they did against Jesus. Let's, let's decide to tell a lie about against him so that they will crucify him. We all know it was meant to happen because that was God's plan, but they still came and gathered against him. There are some, there are those who, who come to raise an insurrection against you. They do not want you to live a life full of faith. They do not want you to advance in every area in your life. So I want you to pray according to verse 2 that God, you see those who are wicked. Come on, open your mouth and pray. God, you see those who are wicked. Look at that verse and pick the key verses that are ministered to you. And pray, God, you see, these, this is what ministers to me. God, hide me from the counsel of the wicked. God, you see what they do in the secret. Hide me from their counsel. They want to stop me from being loyal to you. They want to stop me from being following the faith of Jesus. They want to stop me from becoming like you. They're gathering. They're making an insurrection. They are workers of iniquity. They want me to live a lifestyle of iniquity. God, you see their works. Cut them off from me. You see their works. Cut them off from me. God, you see their works. Cut them off from me. You see those who gather to say, hey, we're coming against this person. We're coming against this group of people. Lord, you see what they want to do. They gather against us. They gather in the places to make plans to make us fall. 
Lord, come against everyone that wants to make me fall from your image in my life. Come against everyone that makes me want to not know the truth. Come against everybody that makes me to want to fall in every area of my life. You see those who gather insurrection against me, stop them. Stop them, God. Stop them, Lord. Stop them now. Stop them now. They come in secret. And Lord, you see the things in secret. You show me in dreams when they want to bring about sexual immorality to the life of my me and my spouse or to the life of me and my church lord god you see what they do we pray against this we say no stop their plans in secret stop their plans in secret god stop their plans in secret stop their plans in secret reveal it unto us oh god show it unto us destroy the insurrection that they decide to build against us destroy that insurrection in jesus name i want to pray according to verse three it says who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. The Bible talks about evil handwriting and that God blots out the evil handwriting. If you don't understand that God blots out evil handwriting, then maybe you don't understand that some people write some things against your life. There are some places, not only in Africa, right here in the UK and in the West and in Asia, all around the world, where they take someone's picture. They kill an animal. They dip it in blood. They get a paper. And they write in blood. For some people, they will write, die on a certain date. And some people end up dying on that date. For some people, they say cycle of fear. And somebody goes in a cycle of fear. For somebody, they say they will never have children. And it takes some people 18 years, 15 years, 20 years to have children. There have been some words, bitter words written against people. I want to say, God, whatever has been written in the past, whatever will be written in the future against me, God, you see this. Blot out. Your word says, I take the promise of your word that it says, you blot out the evil handwritings against me, God. Blot out every evil handwriting. Blot out every evil word against me. Blot out every evil handwriting against me. Blot out every evil word. God, for everyone in this house, from the babes yet unborn to the babes living now, to the royal God, to the Levites, to those who are not even Levites, God, to leaders, to the pastors, to the, to, the, to the leadership in this house, Lord God, blot out every evil handwriting, blot out every evil handwriting, Jesus, everything written against us, every evil report, every bitter word sent, God, blot it out. Your word says that you blot out the evil handwriting, God. We take a hold of that promise and we say blotted for those that have been written against saying that they will not pass through university or they will keep going years and years and years repeating the same course God we say blot it out Father Lord God we speak for those who have been saying that they will never come to know the truth they will never come to know who is God they will never come to know where God lives they will never come to know the relationship of how to live a place filled and loving God we say blot it out we come against the writings written that this person will live a life of fear this person will never get over whatever it may be whether they were raped whether they were mistreated whether they were molested whether they were whether they were maligned whether they were made fun of whether they didn't understand something in school and that thing is still holding them down lord god we say blotted out for every person who's walking in a cycle of poverty and who keeps going from just bill to bill, bill to bill and just paying bills and never able to do anything more. Lord God, we say, we take on the promises of evil handwritings being brought it out and Lord God, we say blotted. Father, Lord God, by the blood, by the power and the blood of Jesus, we take that and we smear that against and hold it up against every bitter word. Father, Lord God, you said that you would give us a land filled with milk and honey. These signify life and these signify sweet things. Father, Lord God, I say every bitter word against our life, blot it out in Jesus' name. Blot it out. Blot it out in Jesus' name. Blot it out in Jesus name. Blot it out in Jesus name. Blot it out in Jesus name. Father Lord God, for those that have been written against, that they will never climb further in you. Lord God, we hold on to the promise. We hold on to the promise that says that you desire to see us prosper, our soul prosper. In all things, oh God, we hold on to that promise and we say, Lord God, that they will go further in you. That they will not stay in that same place.
for those who truly want to seek truth and you said that if we seek you we shall find you for every person who is seeking truth oh god we pray tonight in agreement and say that they will find truth they shall find you lord and father lord for every lost soul in this city god there are many people going about proclaiming the good news gospel the true gospel this week from today for the next day has come for your word says the evening and the morning was the first day as we move into this day as we command our morning right now god schedule people to run into believers who will come to know the truth who will come to know the way who will come to know the life who will come to know you as lord schedule instances where they will run into people oh god the truth always speaks for itself the truth never make it a lie let them encounter truth this weekend oh god Amen. father lord if i have spoken anything that wasn't your word it will fall to the ground and it will not last but if truly your holy spirit's counsel has stood today let it judge accordingly oh god Lord, judgment is not only bad. Judgment is good for those who fall on the right side and bad for those who do not fall on the right side. The Bible says that you gave the cup and you drank the wrath of hell so that we could escape. There is nothing we can do to attain living with you forever, to attain attending the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is nothing that we can do of ourselves but to take on your righteousness and to live a lifestyle that pleases you. That is all we can do. And even that is done by the help and the strength of the Holy Spirit. God comfort us in this race. Father Lord, as we now read this verse 10 together, we don't just want to read it out loud, God, as a clanging symbol or as a rhetorical religious line. Let it have an effect on our lives. We call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read verse 10 of Psalm 64 together. Amen. Now this time, let us read it but personalizing it and call yourself. Let me give you an example. I am righteous. I shall be glad in the Lord. I shall trust in him. And I shall be upright. And I shall glory. So let's take it again. I shall be righteous. I shall be glad in the Lord. I shall trust him. I shall be upright in my heart. And I shall glory. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. Amen.